Hey, like many of you have been over the last several weeks, I got sick this week. Um, do you feel sad for me? Feel sorry for me? Yeah. I think you probably should feel more sorry for Nicole. Apparently, I'm a little bit of a needy patient. Um, so, on top of that, not only am I a needy patient, apparently I'm a little crazy under the influence of NyQuil. And so um, she had to put up with both of those uh, this week. NyQuil was uh, the weapon of choice uh, in my fight against this sickness uh, that I had. And man, NyQuil is some powerful stuff. Like apparently I was uh, saying some stuff and I don't remember any of it. And so you can get all those great stories from Nicole later. We don't need to go into them now. Um, But NyQuil is powerful stuff. But when Nicole went and picked it up from the store, I wasn't, getting better because the medicine was in the house. It, it's powerful stuff, but it's not powerful enough that you can just open it and let it breathe, and I breathe in the fumes of it. Now I had to take the medicine. I had to take it into my system. And I'm going to talk to you tonight, to, this morning. See, I'm, I promise I'm not still on my phone. <laughs> oh boy, we're starting off on a great foot here. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you this morning about um, God's armor, but um, it, you need to be really clear on the fact that this armor, this armor of God that I'm going to talk to you about, that it's not something that, man, if I just get these tools, then I'm good to go. It's not that, that the armor of God is this equipment that I get from God because with this equipment, I can take on the big bad devil. But rather, the armor of God is all about me having relationship and being close with God. God is the armor of God. He is our armor. And Paul makes it very clear in this letter that throughout all of this, what he's talking about is God being with us and God fighting on our behalf. All right. And so let's look at Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 18. And uh, you'll see that Paul is making that, that emphasis throughout these verses. Verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or strategies of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And so there's several places where Paul emphasizes there. Verse 10, he says, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of Him. His might. It's not our strength. It's the whole armor of God. Verse 13, he emphasizes again the whole armor of God. And at the end, after he's given us all of this equipment that we can put on, he tells us that we need to be praying always. Now, I know I've already made a couple of mistakes uh, this morning, but I promise I'm not still on NyQuil, okay? I'm better. I am about 95% well. I've found that as I get older, it takes a little bit longer to bounce back from these things. But I have overcome my illness to the point where I'm no longer actively taking that medicine. Right? It would be unhealthy if I continued to take NyQuil on a regular basis for the foreseeable future. That would do long-term damage. The armor of God is not something that we put on or that we take in during hard times. And then once we get through that hard time or we get over that that phase or that season, that then we're good to go on our own. It's not that the Lord comes and helps us and then once he kind of helps us get our footing, then we're on our own. We never move beyond our dependence upon God. We will always be dependent upon him. 
It's not that the armor of God or that the Lord's help or his aid is only something you need when you're a baby Christian or that when you first come to be a believer. This is something that you must continually experience throughout your life. And Paul makes it very clear where we're at without the Lord's help in the beginning of this letter in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 into the beginning of chapter 2. So turn to the beginning of this book and we're going to read those verses so you can see just where we're at without the Lord's help. Paul has a prayer for them. He says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, that you might constantly come to know Him more. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you might come to know things, that you may know what is the hope of His calling, what the riches of His glory is of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding, and I want you to really hear this, all right? This is who's on our side. The exceeding greatness of His power to usward, who believe, according to the working of His mighty power, which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand in heavenly places. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead, God has pointed towards us. He is brought to work in us. The same power that worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand in heavenly places. Now where is Jesus said? Seated. He's seated next to the Father. And that means that He is, verse 21, far above all principality, and power, and might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. He says, the one who is on our side, Jesus, is has power above all principalities, above all spiritual darkness, above every name that can be named. There's no name that we can name that is like, oh boy, I don't know if Jesus can take that one. Every name, he's above it. All things are under his feet. He is on our side. But notice what verse 1 of chapter 2 says. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. Quickened means to make alive. Without Jesus, we're dead. Apart from the work of God, we are dead already. It's not that we are able to go and maybe do a little bit of damage against the devil on our own. If we don't have God working in us, we can't even walk onto the battlefield to face Satan because we are dead already. Without him, we're nothing. And so we never move beyond this dependence upon God. We must always have him animating us, empowering us in this life Without him, we can't do it. Now, a lot of times when we think of armor, we think of maybe something that like a catcher wears, you know, in baseball, or a football player wears. And, and, and that armor, the armor covers over the muscle and, and, and the fiber and the tendons of that player to protect where the power and the skill lies. But that's not what happens with the armor of God. The armor of God doesn't cover what is the power and the skill. The armor of God is the power and the skill. And the armor of God empowers us because it becomes a part of us. It's like that medicine that when I take it, it becomes a part of me. It becomes a part of me and it begins to wage war on the infection that has become a part of me because one of you passed it on to me. (laughs) It's totally someone in here's fault. (laughs) And so that, that evil... That disease that became a part of me, the medicine became a part of me and fought against it. This is important, okay? If we only think that evil is out there, that the evil we fight is out there, we have missed it. Because one of my biggest enemies is me. It's my own sin. It's my own heart. It's my own mind that works against me. And so just as sin has become a part of me, the Lord becomes a part of me, and he has to do this work within me. And so the armor of God is not a brand of armor. It is literally God himself coming to be a part of my life and waging this war in me and also waging this war against the evil one. 
And so then Paul lists here in this passage of Scripture six elements of armor that is, has been made available to us. All right? And each one of these elements of armor we could preach a whole message on. And this is the 11 o'clock service, and normally I could go as long as I want, but today's Nicole's birthday and I'm taking her to lunch, so we got to hurry. All right? <laughs> So the first element of this armor is the belt of truthfulness. And when we hear the word truth, a lot of times in the context of church, we think of the truth of God's word, and that's absolutely fitting, and we're going to get to that later. But here, it's not talking about just the truth of God's word, but it's talking about a general truthfulness, about being honest. And if we are not honest about where we're at, about what we're facing, about what we're struggling, we will not be able to have the Lord working on our behalf. Now, the temptation is for us to come to church and pretend that everything is fine, for us to put on our happy face, even though we have been upset all week, we've been fighting with everyone, we've been depressed, we've been unhappy, but we come into church, we put on a big smile, and everything is great. And that doesn't scare Satan at all. Satan is not afraid of a hypocritical church. Because if we are just pretending that nothing's really happening, no work is really being done. And so the very first element in this, this godly armor, this battle armor for spiritual warfare is we've got to be honest. We've got to open up about what we're going through. We've got to be honest about the fact that we're struggling. John Calvin, the theologian who wrote Institutes, he, he writes this book who's going to just have this incredible impact on, on church theology. And the opening, he says, there's really no wisdom apart from wisdom of knowledge of God and knowledge of self. That we really can't understand what we need to understand about God unless we understand the truth about ourselves. And we can't understand the truth about ourselves unless we understand the truth about God. And if we are in the dark about either of those, we're in real trouble. And I think that all of us would very quickly agree, like, yeah, I need to know the truth about God. But are we as clear in the fact that we need to know the truth about ourselves? We need to be honest about who we are, about what we're doing, about what we're struggling with. We can't pretend. Uh, a week ago, Pastor Eric and I were introduced to this chart, and I just found it to be so helpful. I've already used it a couple times this week, and I want to share it with you this morning. What this charge points out is that as time goes on, we come to experience grace. We come to know Christ at this moment of conversion. And in that moment, we realize, we have to admit that we are a sinner and that God is good. We recognize that He took the punishment for our sins, that He went to the cross for us to take the, the, the sin of our hearts upon His own back and to suffer for it. And in that moment, we realize what the cross means. And through our lives, as we walk with Jesus, we come to understand more and more, not only about how good God is, but more and more about how good I'm not. How I am not good. You know what? I'm going to find out next year there's going to be a, another layer to my depravity and my sinfulness that I hadn't yet discovered. But the further I dig, the more I realize that this is a broken man that was desperately in need of Jesus. But what's beautiful about that is that as I discover more and more of my own brokenness and my own sinfulness, and as I realize just how badly I needed Jesus to offer me forgiveness, as I realize more and more how good He is and how good I'm not, the importance of the cross just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But if it's been a long time since the cross, the sacrifice that Jesus made for you, the fact that he took your sins upon his own back and took the punishment that you deserve, if it's been a long time since that truth just wowed you, it might be that it's been a long time since you learned more about God's goodness, and it's been a while since you've recognized your own need. And all of us should be growing in awareness of how good God is and how broken we are. But that doesn't happen if we're not being honest with ourselves. Paul says you need to gird your loins with truth. And people back then, they didn't dress as fashionably as I do, so they wouldn't wear nice clothing like this. They wore, they wore big flowing robes, all right? 
They, they wore big floor. And there's a reason when we do Christmas plays and Easter plays, kids wear a big bathrobe, right? Because that's a lot like what they wore. But a bathrobe is not ideal fighting gear, right? And so to, to kind of cinch all of that up, to cinch those garments up, they would use a belt to keep those big flowing garments close and tight. When they were going to get down and do some work in the field, they would gird their loins. They would bring those, those clothes tight. They would tie them in a knot. Or they would put a belt on to kind of cinch everything up so they could make their way through the rows of the field. When they were going to fight, they would gird their loins. They would cinch things tight. And the belt of truth is the first part because if, if we haven't gotten honest, we're not serious about fighting yet. If we haven't gotten honest with ourselves... We're not serious about this spiritual fight yet. We haven't even started fighting. You see, Satan would love for us to think that the only, the only enemy is out there and to neglect the fact that there's an enemy in here. It's my own flesh. And if I don't get honest about what's broken in me, if I don't get honest about the things that I struggle with, if I don't get honest about the bitterness that I'm holding on to, the anger I'm holding on to, if I don't get honest about the hurts from my past and the besetting sins, if I don't get honest about that, I haven't even started to fight yet. And so the first element of spiritual armor is truthfulness. It's being honest. It says, put on the belt of truth and put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, what, what God has done for us on the cross is He's made it possible for us to take the righteousness of Christ and have it applied to our own lives. And this is referred to as imputed righteousness. In other words, it's not righteousness that I've earned, but rather it's righteousness that God put on my account. All right? Let's, let's just dream for a moment, okay? Let's dream that right after the service, I mean, the service was just really moving and you were praying, God, please show me some favor in my life. And you went down to the bank and you checked your, your bank account status at the ATM, and it said $2 million, right? You would be pretty clear on the fact that you didn't earn that money, but somebody must have made a mistake, right? Or put some money in your account, right? Because I don't think anybody here has $2 million in their account on their own. Um, if you do, remember Venmo. You can give during the <laughs> offering <laughs> later, right? Somebody would have to apply that to your account. That would be imputed money. That would be money that you didn't earn, but somebody put it there. Imputed righteousness is not righteousness that I've earned. It's not because I've been so good. It's because Jesus put that righteousness on me. Now, we are able to have righteousness because it has been imputed to us through Jesus. Now, there's imputed righteousness, and then there's self-righteousness. And self-righteousness is the righteousness I earn. And Scripture is pretty clear about the fact that that's not worth anything. That, that if I'm trying to build up my account with God based on my own self-righteousness, that it's like taking dirty rags. Think about cleaning off the, the, the table or wiping the floor with an old paper towel and then balling all that up and be like, hey, look what I got. It's dirty rags. It's not worth anything. God says that our self-righteousness is that. And so we recognize that we are not able to earn any righteousness, that God has imputed righteousness to us, but there's also a third type of righteousness, and that's practical righteousness. Practical righteousness means that God has made me righteous, and I can't be righteous on my own, but I'm going to live righteously as much as I can. And because God has imputed righteousness to my account, it's possible for me to live righteously, but it doesn't mean it's necessarily going to happen. Like when I become a Christian and righteousness is put on my life, on my behalf, and God looks at me and he sees that I am righteous because of the sacrifice of Christ, and that has been poured upon me. That's how God sees me, but that doesn't mean that that's suddenly the way I live, right? Because we all know that after we become a Christian, we can still make some really foolish choices. Do some things that are dishonoring to God. Do some things that are hurtful to other people. Right? 
And it would be, it would be ridiculous for us to say, hey, it's no big deal though because I'm, I've got Jesus' righteousness, so don't worry about all those things I said behind, about you behind your back. Hey, hey, listen, Jesus has given me righteousness, so don't worry about the fact that I stole $2 million out of your bank account, right? It, practical righteousness should follow that imputed righteousness. And I like what John MacArthur said. He said that while imputed righteousness is about position, practical righteousness is about practice. It's about the things that I do. Now, now here's the thing. Because some of us have experienced the worthlessness of self-righteousness, we've seen how that can breed a judgmental attitude and it can breed hypocrisy. We've run from that. And what I'm afraid of is that running from self-righteousness, we've actually fled practical righteousness too. We've, we've, we've neglected living righteously. And the breastplate was this, was this piece, this coat of armor that a soldier could wear that would protect their most vital organs from damage. And when we live life not caring about right and wrong, when we live life not trying to practice righteousness, we're just opening ourselves to all kinds of hurt. So the second element is the breastplate breastplate of righteousness. The third is to have our feet shod with the gospel of peace. Most people didn't have really nice shoes in Paul's day, but Roman soldiers had some pretty impressive footwear. They had these sandals that had all kinds of straps. You ladies would have loved them. They were really fashionable. Um, had all these straps to make sure that the, the sandals stayed really close to their foot and would, their foot wouldn't slip in it. But they also, they had this kind of this leather sole where they had put pieces of metal in it so that it could have traction so that when they fought, and oftentimes when they would fight, they would have these shield walls and they would have to hold their ground. Those shoes, those sandals made it possible for them to stand their ground. And you and I were able to stand our ground because of the gospel. Not because of anything that we've done, but because of the gospel of peace. What's the gospel of peace? The gospel of peace is that my sin put me at war with God. My sin meant that I had no relationship with God. I was far from Him. I had turned my back on Him. But because of the gospel, the gospel, the message that Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for my sins and no longer am I condemned, I'm no longer at war with God. The gospel is my peace treaty with God. And the gospel of peace means that God is my ally. And if God is my ally, who's going to stand against me? I mean, if God's on my side. Do you remember when you were a kid and you would be fighting with somebody on the playground and you would say, I'm going to get my cousin, and he's like 20. <laughs> and you didn't even have a cousin, but you were trying to scare that kid that you had somebody on your side that was big and bad and could come and beat them. God's on our side. Who's going who's gonna, to who's gonna dare cross us if God is on our side? Uh, this past summer, um, there's, a, there's a song that <clears throat> Sovereign Grace wrote, and um, they sang it at the camp that I spoke at in Virginia. It was the theme song of the, their camp. And so every night before I would speak, they would sing this song, and it became very meaningful to me, and it was so practical. And, and it opens with, now why this fear and unbelief? Has not the Father put to grief His spotless Son for us? You know what that song is asking? What do we have to be afraid of? God was willing to put His own spotless Son to grief for us. There can be no condemnation against us now. So there's the, there's the belt of truth. There's the breastplate of righteousness. There's having our feet shod with the shoes of the gospel of peace so that we're able to stand against the, the, the anxiety of this world. And then there's the shield of faith. Now, when I think of a shield, I think of Captain America's shield, right? I mean, but that's not the right idea. 
Because the shields that Roman soldiers had, they were these really wide, big, thick pieces of wood. And they sometimes would have a piece of metal over the top of them and then a piece of leather over the top of that. And what they would do is they would stand shoulder to shoulder with these shields and they would just make their way towards the enemy, kind of just this moving wall. And then the man behind them would take his shield and he would place it over the top of the person in front of him's head to kind of come to the shield in front of him. And the, the, our arrows could even come in and, and hit him. And they could just make their way slowly and surely towards the enemy. This moving wall of defense. This thick, tall shield that they could hide behind. And it's interesting that in all of the other places here, he refers to these pieces of armor, but this is the only one that he refers to a specific weapon of Satan to use against us. He says, the shield of faith that we might quench the fiery darts of the evil one. You know what Satan loves to do? He loves to take pot shots at us in moments of weakness, in moments of vulnerability, and in times of grief, in times of sorrow, in times that when it just feels like nothing is going our way, when it's just bad news on bad news, when we're, we're wondering, God, what's going on? And there's this, there's this moment of openness or vulnerability, and he sends a fiery dart. A fiery dart. What's a fiery dart? It's, a, it's, an, it's an arrow with flame. Because he's looking to wound us with that dart, but what he's hoping is that he can catch something aflame that will continue to do damage. Right? It's that moment of frustration, that moment of weakness where Satan lobs this thought into our minds and he, doesn't not, he not only wants to like throw us off course in that moment, but he wants that thought to just kind of eat away at our encouragement, to eat away at our peace, and to eat away at our hope. Like an arrow that's lit on fire. There's, a, there's damage in the moment, but then there's this coming damage as the fire continues to rage. And the, the shield of faith is to quench those arrows. And so when Satan takes his shots in those moments of grief and frustration, of weariness, faith is our shield against that. I said, I, I don't understand everything that's going on right now. I don't understand why this is happening. I don't know why God has allowed this to happen, but here's what I do know. I believe that God is for me. I believe that God is good. I know what God has already accomplished in me. I know that He has promised to continue it to the very end. I know that. And that faith that we hold on to, it'll quench those fiery darts of doubt and discouragement that Satan wants to hit us in our vulnerable moments with. So we got the, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. We got our feet shod with the gospel. We've got our shield of faith. And then there's the helmet of salvation. <coughs> Roman soldiers had a, a helmet, and um, it, was, it was really important not only because they could be shot at with an arrow, but oftentimes in these moments where they would be fighting, they'd be in the thick of battle out on the field. One of the, the, the greatest threats to them was a, calvar, a cavalry, a, a group of soldiers on horseback riding in and just hitting soldiers over the top of the head with big heavy weapons or a big heavy broadsword. And so having their helmet on deflected those blows. And what Satan loves to do is he loves to, he loves to tempt us to do wrong. And then the moment we do it, come in and accuse us of how evil we are. Remember that? We talked about that, that Satan is the angel on both shoulders. He's the one tempting us to do the wrong thing. It's no big deal. You won't get caught. Nobody will know it. But as soon as we do, he becomes the prosecuting attorney. And he says, how dare you do that? I can't believe you did that. You're so gross. Everybody's going to know about it. And he accuses us. And he, he makes us feel shame and guilt. He wants to come bashing us over the head with our sins. 
wants to come bashing us over the head with our shame and our guilt. He wants to ride into the middle of everything and just smack us over the head with this this death blow, saying, you're not really saved. You're not really a Christian. If you were, you wouldn't live the way that you're living. You wouldn't feel the way that you're feeling. And man, it's, it's heartbreaking to me that people who have been walking in the faith for decades, they, they, they can come to this place where Satan comes and he crashes them over the head because they're facing some adversity or some trial. And he tells them, if you were really a Christian, these things wouldn't happen to you. And the helmet of our salvation is for when Satan accuses us, we remember our standing in Christ. So no matter what he says about us, we know that in Christ, we are made righteous. Romans 8.1 tells us there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And when Satan comes in and he wants to bash us over the head with guilt and shame and make us feel like we're not, we say, I know that I am in Christ and in Christ there is no condemnation for me. So we've got our belt of truth, our breastplate of righteousness. We've got our feet covered with the shoes of the gospel of peace. We've got a shield of faith. We've got a helmet of salvation. And then we've got a sword, the sword of the Spirit. And Paul tells us the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. You know, it's interesting when when Jesus faced Satan and he was tempted... He didn't do some divine son of God power move on Satan, which he totally could have, right? Like, I mean, he could have made WWF look silly. I mean, he could have suplexed Satan. He could have, I mean, he's the son of God. He could have really put a hurting on the devil. He could have used this great power that he's been clothed with, this immense power that that God has placed in in his hands, But what does Jesus do? When Jesus faces Satan, he does the exact same thing he encourages us to do. He quotes scripture to him. Satan tempts him to do wrong, and he quotes scripture. And the word of God that you carry in your hands, it is is the weapon to use against Satan. It's God's words given to us so that it can come into our hearts and minds, have an impact on who we are, change our thinking, change our feeling, dictate our choices and decisions, and it can even become our words to be pointed back at Satan. The words of God himself can come out of our mouths back at Satan, and we're able to fight against the temptation of the devil because God has taken his word and he's made it available to us. And it is so broad and covers a multitude of topics. And there are verses of Scripture that we can read for encouragement when we're disheartened. And there are verses of Scripture that we can read when things are going great. There are verses of Scripture that remind us who we are in Christ. There are verses of Scripture that make it clear that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. He did raise again from the dead. It's plenty of ammunition there for us to be built up in the faith, equipped for every good work. It's the sword. But a sword does damage when it's out of the scabbard, when it's out of the sheath. When the words of God get off of the page and out of the leather binding and off of our screen and into our hearts and minds. When Satan comes, we're not going to say, Be gone. I got a Bible. When Satan comes, it will be the the words of God, the truth of God in our hearts, our minds, giving us confidence, giving us encouragement, and being pointed back at Satan. We have 
great and powerful weapons at our disposal. Let's put them to use.